at least 25 biotech VC firms have raised $17 billion in new funds this year. 11 of those topped $500 million. Forbion joined that crowd just last week. We'll look at Forbion's new fund and which other firms are bringing in the money to invest in biotech innovation. Plus, it's a new chapter for MS. Takeaways from BioCentury's conversation with NIH's Danny Reich. And the tide is high as Wave makes another splash. This time with RNA editing data, lifting up other companies in the space, but are all RNA editing platforms created equal? We'll discuss all of this on today's BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, one of the executive editors here at BioCentury, and joining me today are... Simona Fishburne, Editor-in-Chief. Stephen Hansen, Director of Biopharma Intelligence. Selena Koch, Executive Editor. Lauren Martz, Executive Director of Biopharma Intelligence. All right, it's great to have all of you here today. What can I say? Stephen will be your host next week once again. I will be off in Shanghai at the BioCentury Bay Helix China Healthcare Summit. It's our 11th go at this. McKinsey, once again, our partner, will be having some great conversations about what Western biotechs need to do to reinvent their China strategy and what China biotechs need to do to reinvent their strategy. We will have such luminaries as Jeremy Levin of Ovid Therapeutics, Doug Williams of Triarm, all manner of prominent China and Asian VCs in the house. Um, there's still time to register. There's still time to come in as a presenting company. You can reach out to me directly or my colleague, Josh Berlin. Uh, we'll have a, a second podcast this week to dig into the details. We'll be joined by Frank Ledeux of McKinsey and Wendy Pan. She'll be wearing her Bay Helix hat. She's the chairwoman. But as many of you know in the space, she has her uh, hands on many of the uh, cross-border deals in her role at Goodwin. All right, let's dig into some money. Steven, for beyond, $2.2 billion raised last week. That's just 18 months after they raised $1.5 billion. You talked to Sander over there. What did you learn? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I mean, I think it's a pretty impressive couple couple of years for for Four Beyond there, and um, you know that was sort of the first thing that struck me is as you say they'd only just raised this massive pile of money back in April 2023, and that was kind of my first question to him: like, does this mean that you've already spent all that money? And in a sense, yes, that you know they've already allocated that 1.5 billion dollars, committed it to either current portfolio companies or as follow-on money for follow-on capital, I really took that as being actually a really good sign for the state of the private biopharma space, and in particular, I guess, the European space, because nothing's changing for Forbion in terms of their strategy for this new fund. It's still you know, roughly 70% Europe, 30% North America. It's still largely therapeutics. Um, but I just took it as a pretty good sign that there were enough opportunities and enough, you know, high quality opportunities for them to be able to allocate that kind of capital in such a short space of time. Yeah, Stephen, I mean, we'll obviously dig into that more as we approach our Bioequity Europe conference next year. Can you put this in context of other big funds in, in Europe? Where does it sit? Is it is it king of the mountain? It is right now. Yes, you know, you're right. So would they raised. 2.1 billion euros combined, but that's across two funds. So that's 1.2 billion for their uh, late stage growth opportunities fund, their third one. And that, as of right now, stands as the largest single fund raised by European VC so far, uh, surpassing LSP's LSP7 fund, which raised a billion euros back in 2022. Um, they also raised 890 million euros for their venture fund. So that's a lot of money looking at both late and early stage opportunities there. You know, great for them. But to be honest, you know, 
I don't have any data to corroborate this, but you know, the scuttlebutt that I hear sort of around uh, from other VCs and other companies is that Forward Beyond is one of the top, if not one of the, you know, the top performing European VC in terms of ROI. So at least to me, it makes sense that there would have, you know, you'd have a lot of LPs that would be happy to return if they're, if they're getting, you know, pretty good returns themselves. Yeah, I think that's great. I think it also, let's just point out that it it has to reflect to some degree well on European innovation, that they find that many good opportunities and that people are recognizing it. And I just want to also add the issue of growth capital that has for such a long time been the sort of stumbling block in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I don't know to what degree Forbian alone can push through that, uh, through, through that difficult phase. But, you know, we every year for a long time have been focused on that. So, you know, we'll we'll continue to watch, you know, growth capital there. And, and just to that point, sort of this, this Forbian deal kind of prompted us to, to kind of tot up all of the funds that had been raised so far this year. And as Jeff had mentioned, I think in the opener, you know, we found at least 25 firms had announced new VC funds this year, 17.3 billion, you know, combined, which some of that is a bit top heavy. You know, you've got the likes of Flagship, you know, raising 3.6 billion. You've got Arch raising 3 billion and then the four beyond one. But there were still 11 firms that raised over 500 million uh, this year. And, you know, when we looked at kind of where their focus areas were, there were more than half of those funds were doing late stage or growth equity investments. So I think there's a good sort of, at least from from the crop from this year, there seems to be a good spread across sort of the early to late stage investment. So I think that's also a good sign for the for the sector. Let, let me go from there, Stephen, to the sort of mood music because, uh, you know, on the market. So first of all, we're seeing more financing. We saw Seaport today raise over $200 million. I think that was a B round and they've got some some big names there. For a couple of years, we heard a lot of talk about VCs just using their money really to shore up the portfolio companies they already have rather than invest in new ones. Are you seeing a shift now? Are you hearing a shift that they're sort of more expanding their portfolios or their investments to new companies? Is there a substantial enthusiasm shift in the private financing at least? Um. So one of the comments that I found kind of interesting that, that came from Sander, just and this was in, in the context of them deploying, you know, that $1.5 billion over the past 18 months, is he noted that they were essentially able to come across a lot of really good opportunities at really attractive valuations because some of their peers had sort of been pulling back. And so that provided them an opportunity that maybe otherwise, you know, normally wouldn't have been there. But then his follow-up comment to that was that he doesn't expect to see this sort of pace of deployment sort of going forward because he's seeing peers coming back to the market. He's, you know, and so he doesn't expect to have that same level of opportunity going forward. And so just in that one sort of bit, I think that speaks to, you know, what you're saying in terms of VCs looking to go beyond just protecting their existing portfolios and looking for new opportunities. And I think you see that in the deals that are getting done as well. I mean, there's quite a few of these deals where it's not just existing investors in the syndicate, you're seeing new investors coming in. I think we're seeing crossovers coming back again. As you mentioned, the 225 million uh, B round from Seaport today that had quite a few crossovers that were in that as well. So private markets always trail the public markets. There's always a delay there, but I think we are seeing a bit bit more movement there, which is, uh, again, I think that's a positive thing. And just going over to those public markets, there is another barometer that we've been looking at that I'm going to ask Selena to just expand on because, you know, this special word restructuring, which really means layoffs. Um, (laughs) So even though there's still a lot of trimming going on, and we talked a lot about, especially in last year's back to school, about the culling, let's say, too many companies created, there's companies now that are, have been uh, surviving. Stephen, your latest financial preview looked at the number of public companies, non-profitable companies that are, what should we say, living on fumes less than a year's <laughs> worth mm-hmm. of cash. Some of them are, you know, restructuring, so layoffs, you know, to make that runway last longer. Selena, you, you and, and our colleague Richard Guy kind of looked at a little bit like the pace of that seems to be lightening up a little bit. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so Richard looked at disclosures of 
quote unquote restructurings or layoffs, um, whether those are company announcements, which is, can be the case with the bigger ones or um, disclosures and what are called warrant notices, these state notices that are required, right? It's the quiet way of disclosing. <laughs> and he found uh, 22 companies since the start of September, you know, in his analysis, it's not necessarily completely comprehensive, but, you know, it's a rough metric. But if you compare that to what he had found when he did this in just the first two weeks of August alone, that was the same. So it seemed like there may be a bit of a slowing down in restructurings, but this is not, you know, obviously uniform across the field nor is it necessarily permanent. <laughs> At Stephen's recent fourth quarter public markets preview story, he did find for the first time in quite a long time, there are many different factors all lining up, pointing in the same direction towards something that looks like recovery. But you can see if you do an analysis of you know, market performance by market cap, the large caps, as they frequently do, kind of leading the way, they're not only up for the fourth quarter, but for the year, right? And we saw kind of over the last couple of years, many like large scale restructurings at the major pharmas, right? But it kind of culminating this spring in three, but like Bristol Myers Squibb, Bayer, and Takeda all laid off, you know, 1,200 to 2,200 people in that range. Um, and since then, it's really slowed down. So that's a good sign. But as we saw in that public markets preview, there's lots of smaller companies who are still hurting for cash. And so basically, Richard kind of details the ones that are kind of having to, to restructure recently in that story. So we, we have a table in there. We have it broken down by which ones based around, you know, clinical trial misses or other factors, if you want the details. All right. And then coming up in November, we will be on the sidelines of the big, big, big Jeffries meeting in London. We have our second CEO and investor dialogue. Biotech's next challenge, delivering on the story. Simone will be there. Stephen will be there. Simone, can you give us a quick little preview for those who might be interested in joining? Yeah, very excited. I'm going to be having a fireside chat with Eric Tokat, who is of Center View, which is just storming away with all the big deals, basically. <laughs> and uh, I know from another couple of bankers that they're all looking at them. And I said, uh, Sanofi is doing very well. And the other banker said to me, yes, my uh, my boss keeps telling me that. So I think that that's <laughs> going to be a, <laughs> um, and a very interesting conversation, seeing where he thinks M&A deals going. And Stephen is going to be moderating a panel as well. This is a fairly intimate gathering but so sign up now i think um places are quite limited i can't remember exactly what the cap is there is obviously networking as with all the biocentury events mm. we get the best people in the room so you want to meet the best people be the best people and join us there in london jeff you may have the sign up details we'll put them in the show yeah notes. i i biocentryjeffries.com and and simone i just like to say that's e eric tokat to you he is of course co-president of investment banking at Centerview Partners. I you were going to tell me that E is for Earl or Lord, or I think you're going to give me an, a, I, tell me that he got some kind of super, I'm super an peer. unwashed <laughs> American. I, yeah. I, you know, I'm not allowed to even say the word Lord unless I'm yeah. referring to that musician that was around for a little while. Um, but I like a little drum roll because Stephen is about to learn what panel he is moderating at the Jeffries Conference, and Stephen, hold on to your hat. You will be joined by Laura Lane, a VP at Lilly Ventures, Chris Sheldon, who is Global Head of Business Development at GSK, and none other than Erica Whitaker, Head Corporate Wonderful. Venture Fund UCB. And your topic is Delivering on the Biotech Story. You have won the CEO and Investor Roundtable. Congratulations. Perfect. That sounds lovely. That a, that's you, a Jeff. great panel. I know most of this. That is a really good panel. You've got oh, I'm happy with that. I'll take that panel. All right. Uh, for 500, you could go for more. Ooh, I, I'll, I'll stick with that. I, I'm, I'm happy with that, with that group. That'll be good. Excellent. Well, let's turn to MS. Uh, in this segment, Simone 
will once again correct my pronunciation of something. Stephen recently spoke with Danny How Wright. How did I just say it? Danny yeah, he, Wright. Yeah, there you go. Danny Wright. One Wright. more time, one more time. Okay, go on. Are you on me to do it again or you're okay. doing it again? All right, Danny, that's not hard, right? Danny Reich. And he listens to this podcast, so you better behave. Yeah. Well, I know. I, I, you know, I'm still working on Wimbledon. You are and working on Tottenham. That. Yeah. How about oh the God. Spurs, Stephen? Yeah. All right, so Stephen recently spoke with this great man about recent data that could shape drug development's future for progressive multiple sclerosis, as well as neurodegeneration more broadly. Now, Selena edited this piece, so I'm going to bring Selena in first because she's our neuro guru, as I like to say. Selena, what did you see in this piece and, and what were your takeaways from the conversation? Well, um, I actually kind of think Stephen should tell us about the data upon which this is based and then we can get into the takeaways. But this is one of these kind of fun stories where, in this case, Danny, a reader, said, hey, you published on some news recently, and what you said was correct, but I would have emphasized something different and led us down this path to this really interesting story. So thanks for that, Danny. But it's about this new class of molecules in development for MS that's had, you know, a bit of a rough time, but a lot of excitement behind it, BTK inhibitors and the most recent data. You want to tell us what those data were, Stephen? Yeah, sure. As you say, Selena, so uh, Sanofi had phase three data for their BTK inhibitor uh, talabrutinib that missed the primary endpoint in a relapsing remitting uh, study on annualized relapse rate versus turofluoramide. But as Danny pointed out, the really interesting piece was what it showed on disability progression. And in particular, so there was a third phase three trial uh, that was called the Hercules trial that combined with a pooled analysis of the two relapse remitting studies, both of them showed that the um, BTK inhibitor could delay the onset of confirmed disability progression in patients that have non-relapsing secondary progressive MS. And so that's sort of kind of the key thing is, is sort of pointing out that this is kind of the first time that we've seen a brain penetrant immune modulating therapy show an impact on disability in these non-relapsing progressive patients. That's right, because when patients are relapsing, remitting, right, they have these periodic kind of large acute flare-ups of inflammation. You get some breakdown of the blood-brain barrier that allows this like massive influx of immune cells. And that, you know, it, then it re remits for a while and then it happens again. So you have these bouts, but the character of the disease changes over time, right? And so later it kind of becomes this, what they call secondary progressive where you're not having this wide scale breakdown of the blood brain barrier anymore. You're getting more like compartmentalized chronic inflammation just inside the CNS of the resident microglia cells and whatever remaining kind of immune cells are, are still there. And then it's much more like a neurodegenerative disease. And there hasn't been much <laughs> or anything, depending on how you look at it, depending on your interpretation of the data <laughs> to treat this. So now what we have is so neuroinflammation, I have to stress this, is a super hot topic across all of neurodegeneration right? and even psychiatry, but it's a new field. It's a hypothesis. And what it lacks right now that would benefit the field greatly would be some sort of positive control, meaning something that works. And so the way he's looking at this is now we have this Sanofi drug that has demonstrated some amount of efficacy in this more neurodegenerative context with a mechanism that works on neuroinflammation. So now you could crack open the door just a little bit and study the heck out of this thing and figure out what are the biomarkers that tell us that this neuroinflammatory component is resolving the way it needs to, to have an effect on disability, because this did show an effect on disability. The relapse and remitting form of the disease, it has greatly benefited from MRI right? So we have like the lesions that happen when you have these acute inflammatory attacks show up on MRI and you can use that in phase two studies and they can predict whether something's going to work in phase three. We don't have that for progressive forms of the disease or other kinds of inflammatory diseases. So it just sort of, yeah, it raises this possibility of like, maybe we can get towards these biomarkers. Yeah. I, I think that's what he's kind of hoping for, right? I mean, he's kind of hoping that this is the, because he alluded to that in our conversation about how 
way back when, when interferon was kind of the first positive phase three and relapse remitting, that's basically what that data was what helped establish MRI as the predictive endpoint that it, you know, thus became. And I think what he's kind of crossing his fingers and hoping for is that this is kind of that moment for a progressive disease where you have this have, have this finding that can then help to help you identify a, a biomarker or a set of markers that you can use in phase two studies, in phase two B studies that can be predictive for whether a drug is going to work in progressive disease. I think this is interesting on so many levels and something that I was thinking that you, what you just said, Stephen, sort of leads into that is what Danny said is that the success of marketed therapies has converted almost everybody into having primary progressive MS, you know, to a greater or lesser extent. And that sort of goes back to what Selena was explaining about the inflammatory component. And what he's sort of saying is that to some degree that we can now get at that it's been exposed because of the success of these current therapies, which have sort of evolved over what the last decade or more, I suppose. 25 more? years. Yeah. 20, yeah. 25 years. Okay. You know, fine. Um, <laughs> what's a decade or two between friends, you know? Um, <laughs> so I, I think that that sort of idea that the, and we've seen this in a few other fields actually, but the first generation of drugs sort of allows you to explore the biology better behind the disease. It exposes things. So, you know, this was very interesting on, on several levels. I think it's, you know, interesting to know, uh, Danny was actually on the steering committee for the Sanofi phase three trials of telebrutinib in MS. He assures me he's not paid by Sanofi. I actually have to ask him where he is paid by. But anyway, um, so he has, you know, no dog in this fight, except as a physician and somebody who is obviously treating patients and, and cares about that. But I thought it was it, it was particularly interesting for us. And we're always open to this um, for somebody saying, hey, here's a different angle that the first view of the data, or even the second view of the data doesn't necessarily, necessarily expose. And so bringing that to our attention allowed us to really focus on that, which, which means that we invite your comments, maybe not all of them. But um, many of your comments. <laughs> we well, you can also uh, you can also drop us a line uh, in the show notes. You'll see there's a way that you can text us or email us a question. We've done one so far. It's fun for us as our listeners keep us on our toes. And what can I tell you? We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to bring in Lauren to talk about the big Eagles win over the New York Football Giants and. We might get in a little bit on WAVE, uh, which had some pretty awesome data. From ADCs to buy specifics, deal making between China and the West is accelerating. At the same time, the world is changing, requiring new strategies to succeed. This October, BioCentry, Bay Helix, and Insights partner, McKinsey and Company invite you to Shanghai for the 11th China Healthcare Summit. Network, partner, and debate with industry peers and get a first-hand look at China's life sciences ecosystem. Register today at biocentrychinasummit.com. Can't visit Shanghai? Register instead for a digital pass. All right. Lauren, thank you for being patient. How'd you feel about that Eagles game? I didn't watch that Eagles game, but, you know... We're, I think we're now ahead 95 for the Eagles and 89 all time against the Giants. Mm. And if we could play them every week, at least this season, I would welcome that. But hey, let's talk about Wave. These data got their stock roaring and quite a few other companies got moving as well on the data. Now, what were these data? So RNA editing oligo data that demonstrated that it's possible to change a single base in an RNA to correct a disease causing mutation in patients. And the indication alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Lauren, what stood out to you? Well, I think this got so much attention because it's just the first time that anyone has shown that in the clinic that you can do an RNA edit. There are a lot of different ways to do this. There are the CRISPR approaches, the, you know, the base editing type approaches for RNA, but there's also this oligo approach. So yeah, Wave is not the only company doing this, but it's really interesting because you're just delivering 
a short nucleotide sequence. I mean, it's a galnet conjugate. But the idea behind this technology is that, you know, you deliver the sequence, it goes to the target site where the mutation exists, and then it sort of co-ops this endogenous enzyme that exists in the body that makes these base edit changes. So this enzyme specifically changes an A base to an I, which is red as a G. But anyway, it, there are specific point mutations that this type of system can correct. And alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency happens to commonly be caused by you know a point mutation that, that this technology works well for. I think people see this as proof of concept that you know, this is a technology that can make this kind of change, can lead to a durable effect. This was two months of treatment, 57 days, and the amount of protein produced was sustainable for that time. So I, I didn't go into the data. Basically, what they found is that they're able to generate about 60% of normal AAT protein expression. And these are in patients who are lacking normal expression completely. So, you know, the target was about 50%. Patients who are heterozygous for this mutation generally function pretty normally. So, you know, the company saying this is better than expected. This is better than what they saw in mice and, um, you know, overall a, a big positive. Lauren, can you just talk a little bit about the advantage of this approach over gene therapy for this disorder? Yeah, so the benefit of actually correcting the mutation here, which a gene replacement type therapy wouldn't do that, that it would just deliver a corrected gene. But the benefit is that not having the wild type protein is a problem. Also, having the mutant protein is a problem. So when you don't have the wild type protein, you get some inflammatory disease in the lungs and some other organs. When you have the mutant protein present, it aggregates in the liver and it can cause cirrhosis. So really the goal is, is to do two things. You want to get rid of the mutant protein and also add the functional protein. So there are strategies to add the functional protein that exists that help with lung disease. That doesn't do much for the patients who have liver disease because of this mutant protein that aggregates. There are these RNA editing approaches. The DNA base editing approaches would do the same thing, but they would do that in a more permanent way because you're editing the DNA. So you know, whether or not that's a positive or negative, it remains to be seen. And that's what BEAM is doing. And BEAM has a trial for this indication ongoing. And do we know enough yet about the different companies who are all focused on this oligo approach, how they differentiate because they all got stock bump off this news? <laughs> so we know a bit about the chemistry of, of waves WVE006 and, and, you know, the chemistry behind their oligo technology. We don't know as much about the other companies. And, um, you know, we have ProQR is doing a similar thing. They don't have this program in the pipeline. There's CoroBio. And there is also a company called Erna Therapeutics. So, you know, we don't know how the chemistry differs. We do know that it's important because you're co-opting this endogenous protein that tends to like to act on mutations in certain situations, like, you know, it recognizes something that may be an error in the RNA based on the bases that are next to it or certain things like that. So getting it to make this actual change at this site isn't necessarily straightforward. And, and WAVE has done a lot of changes to, to make this more effective at doing that. We don't know too much about how some of its competitors are doing that. But again, th this is seen as a positive for everyone. Yeah, Wave's and 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 WAVE itself has had you know, um, up and down sort of roller coaster history. So probably worth just pointing out, you know, what this means for the company itself. Yeah. So they, you know, they've they've been around for quite a while now. Everyone is excited about their stereo pure chemistry for the antisense technology. They had some clinical setbacks that sort of led the company to lose a lot of value. But this year has been a big turnaround. This data, in addition to what we saw just in September have been really meaningful for the company. They they have, I think, what most might be the most advanced exon 53 skipping therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and the data there look very good, too. And their original indication was Huntington's, which they struck out with a couple of times, kept going back to the drawing board. It's one of these stories where, like, if you can just hang in there, if you have enough cash to keep, you know, <laughs> working on your technology, uh, maybe you can turn things around. That had some positive data earlier this year as well. I think we're expecting more Huntington's data too. Yeah. 
All right, thanks for that, guys. Uh, looking forward to seeing what's next for Wave. They are certainly on a roll uh, recently, which is always nice to see, especially for a company that's taken its knocks over the years. Check out the latest episode of our sister podcast, The BioCentury Show. It features Simone in conversation with Lazard's Dale Rain and Michael Kingston, their global co-heads of biotech at Lazard, and it's a great conversation breaking down what's happening with deal flow right now in the biotech world. Links to all the stories we discussed on today's podcast can be found in the show notes or by going to biocentrypodcast.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back in a couple of days with our China Summit preview with Frank Ledoux of McKinsey and Wendy Pan of Bay Helix and Goodwin, as well as Josh Berlin and BioCentury co-founder and CEO David Flores. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for BioCentury this week. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education.